thank you very, very much indeed, Arthur, um, for that introduction. And thank you very much indeed, everybody, for coming along this evening. Um, Arthur's already sort of said a little bit about who I am, um, but just to explain a little bit about why I've got this interest, I suppose, in ladies' peels. Um, I suppose it stemmed initially from when I was a, a student in London, which obviously isn't very long ago, um, and we used to ring quite regularly at Cubit Town, where there is a photograph of, of some very austere looking ladies, which you will see very shortly, um, the first band to ring a ladies peel. And over the years, I've rung quite a number of ladies peels. And when Julia Cater began her um, the project with various other people on women in ringing recently, I volunteered to write an article about ladies peels, thinking I could write everything in one article. Well, the more research I did, the more fascinating information I found out. Um, and so it's become a bit of a, well, a lockdown project that's kept me out of mischief, shall we say. And I'm gonna try and condense a lot of things into an hour. I will do my best. Um, so the, the title from hats to bikinis will become apparent as we go through. So first of all, Martha Williams, let's start with her. Um, if I could see you all, if I was in front of a class, I'd ask you all to put your hands up and tell me who Martha Williams is, because I suspect that lots of you, like me actually, not very long ago, had no idea who Martha Williams was. Well, anyway, she was the first woman to ring appeal. And this is it. She was the wife of George Williams, so there she is in uh, Mrs. George Williams, obviously, but she did actually have a name. She was called Martha and she was the first woman to ring a peel. But as you can see, it's a handbell peel. She never did learn to ring tower bells. Um, and in fact, she rang three handbell peels. Obviously, her husband was a very, very um, well-known ringer. He was a thousand peeler in his time. And in fact, he also conducted over a thousand peels. So in the 1890s, he was very noted and, and still is today. He was a Cumberland and one of the first members of the Central Council when the Central Council was um, formed. And they lived in Brighton and Martha had an interest in ringing a appeal. She wanted to ring appeal in hand. And when St Nicholas Brighton bells were being rehung, in the 1890s, the opportunity arose because Thomas Blackbourne and Alfred Goddard were also handbell ringers, and so a handbell peel was rung. And as I say, that was the first woman to ring a peel, Mrs. George Williams, or Martha Williams, in 1892. Alice White, as um, Arthur's already mentioned, followed on only a few years later, and she was the first woman to ring a peel on tower bells. She was the daughter of Henry White, who was then the captain, the tower captain at Basingstoke, St. Michael's Basingstoke. And she learned to ring when she was aged 11. Um, like many of the, the rare breed of women ringers in those days, she was the daughter um, of a ringer. Most of the women ringers were daughters of ringers or maybe the incumbents. And she'd been used to going up the tower with her dad um, for many years since she was a little, um, a little girl and she um, she was torturing when she was aged 11 and as you can see here rang her first peel when she was aged 15. It's interesting that Thomas Blackbourne the bell hanger was also in that peel. Um, just putting this into context Queen Victoria still had another 20, no she didn't, sorry when she was born she still had a few years to <coughs> reign and the, the electric light bulb had only been um, invented a couple of decades before. In the ringing world, sorry, the Bell News in those days, when the peel was published, there is an absolutely wonderful editorial, which I'm going to read to you, which really places it into the context of the time. And it says, when we read so much fool foolishness about what is termed the new woman and her athletic, with a question mark in brackets, pursuits, it is more than refreshing to read of a daughter of the exercise like Alice White, who by her ingenuity and application to a scientific and health-giving practice has put to shame and rebuke those females who, being on what is considered the wrong side of middle life, don't quite know what that means, have the effrontery to advocate occupations and pastimes for their sex, which are repulsive to all true womanly feeling. So there we go. Um, we'll come back to Alice a little bit later. 
oh, sorry, and as, um, as you can see there from the date, as Arthur said, this Friday, February the 12th, is the 125th anniversary of um, that peel. There was obviously a big celebration organised by Heather Kippin a hundred years on the hundredth anniversary, not a hundred years ago. Sorry, Heather, um, for the hundredth anniversary. Um, obviously, this year we might manage a few bell ball, um, ringing room performances, um, but I hope that will be marked in some way. So we come on to the first attempt for a, a ladies' peel, in other words, a peel rung by a complete band of women. And that was attempted at Cubitt Town in London in July 1911. I've put a photograph there just to try and put this into context. Um, it was a time of great social change, votes for women, the suffragette movement, and the Titanic that year had just been launched, um, not on its maiden voyage, but from Belfast. So, you know, just thinking of that and the, the context in which this first lady's attempt took place. It was arranged by Edith Parker, again, the daughter of a well-known ringer, Mr. J. Parker of Edmonton. And as it says here, she was a lady of very firm character, determination and powers of leadership. She saw clearly that if ladies were to achieve any standing in the exercise, they must first prove that they were equal to the menfolk in the tower. But the first task was to show that ladies could ring appeal without male assistance. Now, I have a great deal of admiration for Edith Parker, not only in terms of her ringing and leadership ability, but I discovered something just the other day was that in 1914, she was the scorer for a Cumberland versus College Youths cricket match. Um, and any lady that understands the rules of cricket, which I don't, um, has my admiration. I know there are some people watching today who do. The band that she chose was chosen not just for their competence during Grand Sir Triples, which was very much the method of the time, but also as per persons of temperament not likely to be perturbed by the importance of the occasion, nor by the knowledge that they were listened to outside by a band of expert critics, which in most cases was going to be fathers and brothers who came along to listen. But again, let's think, this is 1911, let's think about the logistics. First of all, the band is going to be assembled, she assembled the band across, from across the country. So ringers from Edmonton in North London, Alice White, who we've already just mentioned, was an obvious choice. And then various other people, Mary Nightingale, Lillian Wilson, Mary Jukes and Nellie Gillingham. Nearly all of those, in fact, it may have been all, but I know for certain that a lot of those were the daughters of well-known ringers, which is presumably how Edith, via her father, probably knew them. They were all young women and obviously would have traveled to London and as young single women, would have needed to be chaperoned. And also, she couldn't have just sent them an email or picked up the phone. There would have been a letter arriving and they would have had to respond back by letter. So all those logistics, so much more complicated than we think about today. Lots of challenges. Um, as James Parker, Edith's father said, here are girls brought a hundred miles to strange bells and without practicing together. We all know what it's like today with a band of ringers who don't know each other and just getting used to ringing together. It's hardly to be expected, but give them a chance. So not necessarily rating the odds. There were the distances traveled. Because they were traveling from all over the country by railway, it was four o'clock by the time they all arrived at Cubitt Town. It's good to know that even in 1911, there was pre-peel faffing perhaps not the tying of shoelaces and offering round of polos that I experience with a certain person sitting up to my right here, but photos being taken and lots of faffing. Mechanical issues. It was obvious that after a short while, it was obvious that something was wrong with the seventh. These quotes all come from the Ringing World Report at the time. Something was wrong with the seventh and on investigation, it was found that the wheel was rubbing on a shutter recently put into the tower. The weather conditions, there were record temperatures in the summer of 1911 that I don't think from what I read were matched until about the 1990s. Very hot temperatures. Those of you that have rung at Cubitt Town will know it's quite an enclosed tower with only a small window. So I can imagine it being very airless. And don't forget, this is July that we're talking about. And the conductress, or the conductor, who was Nellie Gillingham for the first attempt, 
was intended to be in the 7th, but given, I suspect, the airlessness of the heat, she was persuaded to ring the 5th. So we've got a fairly um, inexperienced conductress, conductor, ringing a bell that she probably hadn't learned the composition from or a change to that. So they got away to a good swing, but at the part end, the bells ran into rounds, having been, having a bob having been missed. So sadly, that first attempt came to an end um, unsuccessfully, but not to be deterred, um, Edith reassembled the attempt for the following year, July 1912, again at Cubitt Town. Again, the band came by, tra uh, by train and were invited at the courtesy of Mr. Hughes from Mears and Stainbank to the Bell Foundry in Whitechapel where luncheon was served and then ultimately found its way along Thameside to Cubitt Town. And I've put this photo here again, just to put it into context. We would jump off the train, jump on the tube, and most of us have probably been to London loads of times. I wonder how they got from the stations to Mears and Stainbank and then to Cubitt Town, whether it would have been one of these buses, hackney carriages, one of the vehicles, types of vehicles in this picture here. And so the band that was assembled on this occasion is this, and this is the photo that still hangs at Cubitt Town. And I've looked at it many times and wondered at the, the clothes that they're wearing on a July day to ring a peel. The band, six of the band were in the original attempt, um, but Mary Nightingale and Alice White um, were unable to ring. So they were replaced with Sarah Piggott and Evelyn Steele, who I gather um, a Bedfordshire lady. A lot of people that I know in Bedfordshire remember her and she was apparently formidable. Um, I think she is probably the back of the right, back row at the right. Um, and at 33, she was the oldest member of the band. As I've just said, Alice White couldn't ring uh, because of ill health. And in fact, her last peal was recorded in 1911 because in, let me read the year right, in 1898, she was turning into or walking across the market square in Basingstoke and she was charged by a rampaging bullock that uh, was on its way to the slaughterhouse, which caused us some pretty severe injuries. And she was dogged by ill health throughout her life. She did actually um, live until the age of 99 and died in 1979, age 99. But after 1911, didn't ring any more peals um, and rang a total of 32, I think it was, in total. So she was unable to be in the first attempt for the ladies' pick the appeal, sorry, the first attempt that was ultimately successful. So for this attempt in 1912, again, the, the band gathered, the start was made, but alas, trip after trip came along and stand was called. The day drew warmer, the Balfour atmosphere denser, with the result that the girls couldn't settle down. And so after about two hours, Mrs. Whittington, who came down to listen, I'm not sure who Mrs. Whittington is, but she has the most dustardly suggestion in my view, she suggested tea. Now, as a lady of a certain age, I think drinking tea on the assumption that you're going to go for a peel attempt again is a very bad idea. However, that's what they did. And I suspect it probably also included a few sandwiches and things and cakes as well. So they returned refreshed, determined on a final attempt. So by now it's, five, it's 10 to six, you know, we're talking about an evening attempt now. Would they get through? After all, however courageous a woman may be, she has not a man's stamina, obviously, or so they thought at the time. So with a view to preventing an accident, and I presume that this was an accident um, in terms of perhaps wanting, needing to faint or rather than any accident um, related to drinking tea prior to a peer attempt, Mr. John Thomas volunteered to sit in the tower in case of emergency. And the peel was scored and this very fine peel board, which was raised by subscription from ringers across the country, is now in Cubitt Town um, commemorating that first peel by a 50th, sorry, by a band of women. Um, and it's as a result of that peel and the interest in lady ringers that was um, national, that the Ladies Guild was founded sometime um, a little bit later that year. 
in the ringing world it said or the um, the write-up in the ringing world afterwards said this is the first but we feel sure it will not be the last ladies peel some of you will have seen um, the articles that I've written in the ring world, so you'll have an idea of the answer. How many ladies peels, in other words, peels by bands of women, have there been? When I started this research, I'd have said 250 at the most. There have, in fact, been 503 since that first one in 1912, and with the last one, as we'll see in a minute, just before lockdown. Just doing a quick um, summary of when those peels have been rung. So we've got tower bell peels in the dark blue and handbell peels in the light blue. As you can see, a sort of slowish growth up until the 1960s with a bit of a dip for the, um, the war period. And then a really big surge from the 1970s onwards. Um, and particularly if you have a look at the 1970s, a lot of handbell peels that year, which we'll look at the reason for that later and also those very numerous peels in the 1980s and 90s. Not surprisingly, not very many in 2020. So following on from the peel at Cubitt Town in 1912, I'm going to look now at some of the um, landmark peels um, throughout the years really, starting with a couple of peels at Portishead. The first of which, so this is actually just the second ladies peel, was in January 1915, and it was Grand Triples rung by a band of ladies, all of whom were ringers at Portishead, and they're in the picture there on the right. I think that's a really impressive achievement. Um, the band included Nellie Gillingham and Mary Jukes, who'd been in the Cubit Town Peel, and all had been taught to ring by Nellie's father. Just imagine the pride, I think, that a band of, well, any band that you have taught can ring a peel unassisted by you on their own. It was the first peel for three of the band, one with a Bob Bell, and Doris Coles, who conducted it, who I think is bottom left, but I may be wrong. Um, she was just 15 years old. That was followed a few years later, three years later, by another peel of Grants of Triples, which again was seven of the local band, and this time Edith Parker um, came and conducted the peel. So those were the second and the third ever ladies' peels. Again, putting those into context, again, we've got a band of all young unmarried women. 1915, 1918. So we're looking at the period of the First World War. So all of those women, I would imagine, had got brothers, boyfriends, possibly even fathers um, away at the front fighting. And they would have witnessed scenes like this one in the photograph there. And it may well be because it was the wartime that Portishead had a band of women, although there was a band of women reported in Saffron Walden um, being taught by Harold, uh, Mr. Pitstow yeah. um, in 1890, which is remarkable. But generally speaking, women were still very much the minority in Towers um, until the First World War, where women started to be taught, um, tower captains, accepted that if they didn't want their bells to be silent, they would have to teach women. And that was certainly the attitude in some cases, though obviously not all. Um, so a lot of women did learn to ring and manned the towers, to use that word, um, filling in for the men who were away on war service. And just also a point of interest, putting it into context, um, the Representation of People Act was passed a few months after the January 1918 peel, so women over 30 who own property or married to a property owner were given the vote. None of the, the women ringers in any of the appeals that we've seen so far would have been eligible at that stage, but that law had been, was passed then. So we come to 1922 and this appeal, I'm really just telling this, is just a wonderful story. Um, it was in the ringing world over Christmas, so you may have read it. If you have, apologies, we'll repeat it again because it's just so good. Um, and I've got a real affinity for this story because I learned to ring at Barton Seagrave in Northamptonshire, which is just down the road from Isham. And Isham was the first tower that I ever rang at other than Barton Seagrave. And I was very confused because I, having learned an anti-clockwise five, these were a clockwise six, which was most confusing. So in May 1922, there was a peel involving a bet, chocolate romance and a rubber bus. 
And in fact, um, there is a poem, a poem about this peel, which begins, it was a lovely day in August on a hill near Simmons Yacht, that two well-known ringers were strolling and having a friendly chat. It turns out that the one was a fair maid that we know was Annie Parkins, who at that time ran at Peterborough, and the owner of a, the rubber bus was Rupert Richardson, who some of you will have heard of, from Surfleet. And I imagine the rubber bus was called such because it had rubber tyres, which in those days would have been still quite a new thing. So the poem continues, the subject was unringing. The lady said, I'll bet before the end of 22, a lady's peel will get. The bus man said, that's wicked, so a lesson I will teach. I'll take a pound of backer to a pound of chocolate each. So the peel was arranged by Annie Parkin. Um, a lot of the ringers, several of the ringers from it were um, picked up by Rupert Richardson in his bus. Several people who were initially invited turned down the peel because they were courting that evening which I have to say, I find most distressing. I think if I was going to be given chocolate, I would have told my young man to, um, I was washing my hair or something like that. Anyway, the ringing settled down, peels, bells peeled softly on. However, the listeners outside heard a clatter, heard someone cuss, which I do hope was a ladylike cuss in 1922. Basically, a bob had been missed and the bells were stood. Someone said, let's start again, said one. I'm in a fix for I've arranged to meet my boy at Desborough at six. I did promise you romance. The other said, that's done it. And they could have wept. They hung up all the bell ropes and out of church they crept. But all was not lost. There was a twinkle in the eye of the bus man, said he. You must first have tea. There we go, that tea again. Then start for the peel that's true. And if Ada can't go to Thomas, well, Thomas must come to you. So off he went um, to Desborough, in fact, to find Thomas, who apparently was playing cricket, and the girls started the peel again. They got back to hear the end, and credit and congratulations they got, and though their hands were full of blisters, they did not care a jot. How many of us have had hands full of blisters, but not been so delighted to have wrung something, scored something? And so that's how the peel was recorded mainly fairly local people um, in 1922, the first time that a, a tenor had been turned in um, in a ladies' peel, or by a woman, in fact, I think. So I promised you romance. Annie Parkins and Rupert Richardson, our pair right at the beginning at Simmons Yacht, later married. And some of you may well remember the 2003-12 bowl final at Surfleet. Um, some people don't remember, even though they were there, because they had partaken of quite a lot of the beer on offer. However, that was um, in the daughter, in the, the grounds of the bungalow of Annie and Rupert's daughter, Edith Enid, sorry, my teeth, Enid Wayman. No idea what happened to Ada and Thomas, but I'm sure, I hope they had a happy ending of some sort. And Phyllis Hare, who was one of the other ringers in the peel, um, there's a photo of her in a moment, became Mrs. Phyllis Poole. She was the mother of Jill Poole, who then became Jill Staniforth, and the grandmother of Rosie Mason. Um, many of you will know of Jill and Rosie and probably Phyllis. So here's the Peel Band, and I just love this photo. Right at the beginning, we talked about hats. Um, we've got Annie Parkins and Phyllis Hare labelled there, but all the ladies resplendent in their hats and costumes of the day and the shoes. There was a lot of discussion about hats, had been since the end of the First World War. Um, an editorial in The Ringing World in 1916 said that no one would think of a lady attending a service without a head covering. And as ringing is now being recognised as closely allied to the service, it seems to be in accordance with the canons of decorum that ladies should wear a head covering. And at a Ladies Guild meeting, 1923, so just after this peal, um, the male chair of the meeting suggested that some useful form of convenient uniform headgear might be chosen and adopted by members of the guild, as some found it difficult to ring in a hat. Now, what I don't know, of course, is whether the ladies rang the peels, the actual ladies' peel, in their hats. I like to think that they were a, um, a bunch of women. I can imagine them going in, locking themselves in, and taking off their hats with a little bit of giggling, um, 
breaking those canons of decorum, ringing their peel and obviously then putting their hats back on again, again, maybe with a bit of giggling, um, to have their photograph taken with those reverend gentlemen that they're standing with. But I don't know, that's just in my imagination. So we come to the first peel on 10. As I say, there, have, there were other peels in between these, but I'm picking out really the landmark peels. Um, and that first peel on 10 was run at, run at St Clement Danes in London. Peel of Stedman Caters in 1926. As I say, the first on 10, Bells by a ladies band, and also notable because um, Clement Danes tenor, which is about 20, 2100 weight, um, is, was at that time the heaviest bell yet rung by a lady. I love the write-up in The Ringing World that goes with this, um, 1926. In such a performance, interest will doubtless turn to the lady who had the pluck and physique to tackle the 2400 weight, whatever it was, tenor. A heavier bell than any lady has previously rung to appeal. This was Miss Ruby Hawksworth, a robust brunette who is only 17 years of age. There have been a number of peels rung to come out at Clement Danes on the anniversary of that peel. And I would just love to see the ladies, um, the tenor ringers of that peel, if they'd been written up in the ringing world as mentioning that they were robust brunettes or whatever else their hair color and physique happened to be. 1928 was the first peel of Major, which was rung at Hansworth in Sheffield in January, 1928. Um, the ringing world of the time gave a sort of who's who of the ringers that you can see there on the right. Just going to pick out a couple of them. Hilda Jakes, who is back row second from the left. Um, she came from Mansfield Woodhouse and she, in fact, was the sister of Lillian Wilson, who rang in the first, that first ladies peel at Cubit Town. She was by far the most experienced member of the band ran her first peel age 12, and she was actually the first lady to ring two peels in a day. Elizabeth Falk from Duffield um, was the tenor ringer and she's bottom left um, in the peel. And in the ringing world, it said she is one of the few tenoras of the exercise. Her first essay as a peel ringer was on St. Valentine's Day. So clearly I quite like that thought because obviously going courting on that evening Peel, ringing appeal was far more important. Um, the choice of Miss Falk for the tenor was a good one. Amongst the sterner sex, the ringer of that bell has a duty to shepherd the strollers when the colts run green, and it must be infinitely more difficult with a band of les filles. Needless to say, the write-up was by a gentleman. Language has changed, as have attitudes. Up until now, Peels, um, all the peels by all women bands have been towel bell peels. Um, the first two handbell peels, by, totally by women, were rung in 1936, in April and June of that year, rung by four sisters. So between them in those two peels. And they were all members of the Johnson family of Hinton on the Green, Worcestershire. And I'm just going to digress slightly from ladies peels because they're quite a remarkable family. There were nine children, all of whom were torturing by their father, Frederick Johnson, who you can see down there. And the picture um, in 1912 there, Frederick Johnson, Joe Johnson in the middle, and his sister Ellen Johnson had rang, rung a, sorry, had just rung a um, handbell peel of Grand Sir Doubles um, in August 1912. Incredibly young. Joe Johnson, who, Joseph Johnson, became a very, very well-known ringer in the area nationally later on. Um, I just have this image, given that we're in lockdown at the moment, of this family with nine children. Some of you have may, may have seen the videos by the Marsh family, who are all very musical and have been putting things on YouTube. I just have ima imagination that the, um, the Johnson family would have rung handbell peels put them all on YouTube and we'd all have been watching them had there been YouTube in 1936 and a lockdown or in the 1912, early 1900s. However, the first handbell peel by a ladies band, um, as I say, was by three of the sisters, Kathleen, Amy and Maggie Johnson. 
Um, and the picture there is from Amy Johnson's Peel book. Judith Rogers, again, many of you will know her. Um, Amy was actually her godmother and she has custody of um, Amy's Peel books. That was um, followed a few months later by another Peel with Kathleen and Amy again, and this time sister Florence, both of them conducted by Amy. Um, she wasn't a child by then, she was aged 29 by the time um, these peels were rung. But just a bit about Amy Johnson. The thing that I find most fascinating was that she married, or one of the things, John Thomas, a bell hanger at the Whitechapel Bell Foundry. You might remember that name. And he was in fact the same John Thomas who sat in the belfry um, in case of accident during that first Ladies Peel in 1912. Um, in 1953, Amy became the first woman to ring 500 peals. Um, again, a fascinating fact. Um, she was asked by Jack, John was known as Jack, her husband Jack, who was, um, she rang most of her peals with a lot of peals with, um, what she would like to ring for her 500th peal. And she said she'd like to ring Stedman triples. However, the band, oops, sorry, the band couldn't decide who was going to call the peal. So they rang it silent and non-conducted Stedman triples, which I think is rather impressive. Um, and Amy rang a total of 663 peals, of which 302 were in hand. And that's also quite an amusing fact because her first handbell peal, that first one that you see there, she only rang it because her brother, presumably Joe, told her that she would be no good at ringing handbell peals. So she rang the peal, um, arranged the, the handbell peel to prove a point. And I think she certainly did. Okay, I won't do my Scylla voice here, but this is the first peel of Surprise by a Ladies Band, which was rung in March, there's a picture there, um, 1928, Cambridge Surprise Major at Crayford. Rung at the second attempt, um, and Edith Parker, who by now was Mrs. George Fletcher, um, conducted that peel. And as we'll see in a moment, she was instrumental in um, arranging many of the first ladies' peels. She was a real driving force. So Cambridge Major was rung at Crayford, and that was followed um, in 1930 with another peel at Ca of Cambridge and Superlative in 1935, again at Crayford, um, both conducted by Edith Fletcher, as she then was. The first peel of London Surprise Major was rung in 1938. Um, that motto at the top of the peel board at Cubitt Town, success is the reward of perseverance, is certainly um, the case here. Um, this was rung at the, there were seven previous attempts, which extended over six or seven years. The band you can see there, um, in fact, the peel you can see written there, you may recognize the writing. Um, it's from Hilda Snowden, the Tenor Ringer's Peel book, um, and George Pipe, who many of you will know, um, wrote her peel, peel book up for her. So the Peel of London Surprise Major, as I say, real perseverance, um, seven attempts. In that photograph, sorry, over those attempts, only two of the original band were in the successful attempt. They were Edith Fletcher and Emma, who was known as Dickie Deal, who caused me a great deal of trouble because we couldn't work out whether Dickie Deal was a lady or a man when we were trying to work out um, ladies' peels. She is the lady, she was the husband, sorry, the wife of Richard F. Deal, who was also known as Dickie, which is very confusing. Um, but thank you to Chris Kippin who put me right on that. And she, I think, is the lady. Yeah. She, I think, is the lady in the middle of the photograph wearing a very smart suit. Edith Fletcher is to her left. Hilda Snowden, a very noted tenor ringer, um, lady tenor ringer, is the tall lady at the back behind Edith and um, Dickie. The two ladies front right were Gwen Kippin, uh, Gwen Kippin and Ivy Housden. Um, who was Kippin, um, members of the Kippin family. Um, Gwen, aged 102, as, as we speak, is the only one of that, um, those early lady ringers still alive. Um, but many of you will obviously know, they may even be here, I don't know, uh, members of the Kippin family. And just to say that Charlie, Charlie Linford, 
um, would be the fifth generation Lady Peel Ringer, with her, Eleanor, Heather, Jessie, and Emily Melvin, who were Melville, sorry, who was Jessie's mother, um, all being Peel Ringers. Um, Jessie, sorry, um, Emily not particularly keen on Peels, but did ring some. So that would be um, a fantastic sort of fifth generation Lady Peel Ringer. And as Chris Kipping said to me, the Kipping ladies were the best looking in the band, the ladies to front right. <laughs> um, let's just put this into context. Um, this was in 1938. By the outbreak of World War I, just over a year later, there'd been 23 ladies peels. 19 were credited to the Ladies Guild, sometimes jointly with a local association. Um, the two handbell peels were run for the Worcester district. The last peel before World War II was the first peel to be rung for the SRCY, the Society of Royal Cumberland Youths, um, the Cumberlands. And Edith Fletcher conducted 13 of those peels with eight other ladies sharing the remainder. Obviously the outbreak of World War II was going to change things dramatically for women um, generally, but also women in ringing too. So during World War II, there were three further ladies' handbell peels, because obviously power bells were not allowed, one in Gloucestershire, two in Dorset. The first tower bell peel after World War II was in November 1945, and it was a peel of Vance Triples in Oxford by the OUS. And I mention this because this was quite, given that women were very much in a minority um, at university in those days, at Oxford University, women were not allowed to matriculate until 1920, and there was a quota of women students until 1957. So the fact that the University Society had enough women to ring appeal is quite notable. Now, obviously, this isn't the 1945 band, but I'm including this um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, this was the first OUS Tower Bell Peel, Ladies Tower Bell Peel, since that peel in 1945, which was wrong for the dinner, the OUS dinner in 2020. And significantly, it was the last Ladies Peel before lockdown and the one and only, as far as I'm aware, in 2020, unless there will be any on ringing room to follow this year. Oh no, we're 2021 now, aren't we? So, right, shut up Linda, go on to the next slide. Okay, there were, there was a very strong uh, ladies band presence um, in Leicester in the post-war years. Um, people like Jill Poole, who we know was the daughter of Phyllis Poole, who's also in that um, peel there. And this is actually um, a page from Jill Staniforth's peel book, Peel of Cambridge Surprise Major on the Middle Eight at the Cathedral. Hilda Snowden, who we've also come across just before, ringing the tenor. She was a very, very, as I say, noted tenor ringer. Um, she rang many peals on a tenor and her, the thing she used to like to make sure people knew was that all of those peals were turned in. She never rang a tenor behind. Um, it was basically that um, Leicester-based band that rang this peal of Cambridge Surprise Royal which the, was the first peal of Royal by a ladies band um, at St John the Divine in Leicester in May 1961. And some of you I know will recognise some of the people um, in that peal. This photograph was taken after, just after the peal. Um, again, Hilda Snowden on the far right. Some of you on Margaret Chapman, Joan Beresford, Hilda Snowden, Kathleen Locke. A lot of people there that you will know, some of you will know. The first Peel on 12 was also a Leicester based band um, and at Leicester Cathedral. Stedman Sinks in September 1964, um, conducted by Joan Beresford again, um, and with Hilda Snowden on the 11th, Doris Colgate on the tenor, Joan Beresford on the treble. So that was the first on 12 peel of sinks. It was a number of years later that a first peel of Maximus was rung um, at St Stephen the Martyr Bristol. Again, coming much more close um, 
closer in date now and some of you will recognise, in fact some of you might even be here, um, some of the people that rang in that peel. Um, total peels of Maximus to date, there have only been 23 peels of Maximus by a ladies band, um, 22 of which have been surprise and one of which has been of plain Bob Maximus. So a significant achievement there. Heather tells me um, about this peel um, that because there were a number of peels rung in Bristol at the time, the Cambridge family were rung and other, I think the first, one of the first of Splice Surprise Major. And Heather said that one of the reasons, one of the really important factors concerning the initial ones in Bristol was the arrival in Bristol of Hilary Muirhead. And I think that's been the case in several places where peels, ladies peels, have become there's been a strong ladies band there's been an impetus from one particular person somebody has arrived who can conduct can ring tenors um Cecile Colburn and Vivian Rigby in Bristol at the time were very good back enders um and so a band who were could ring ladies peels emerged and Heather said that really they did it for fun and a bit of a change it was very much the result of an after practice session in the pub and those with families enjoyed a girls night out leaving the men to look after the children so all sorts of ringing uh, reasons for ringing ladies peels. Earlier we mentioned, I mentioned that spike on the graph where there were a number of um, handbell peels in the, particularly in the 1970s and the early 80s. And those were very much down to um, a band in North America um, in Washington at Washington and Smith College. In Washington, there was a girls' school, Washington Girls' School. Many of the pupils, many of them, learnt to ring at the cathedral and formed what was called the Whitechapel Guild, taught to ring by Rick Dirksen, Quilla Roth, and others. And because they're all women, oops, not supposed to see that one yet. Um, and because they're all women, obviously, they rang ladies' peels and quarter peels. Marge Winter was often the conductor, and she said that she did a lot of the conducting mainly because she was the shoutiest person around at the time, which seems to me like a good reason to be the conductor. Um, and they used to basically pinch the handbells from the music room um, and hide in the changing rooms where nobody would in their right minds go at lunchtime and ring handbells, several of them, and gradually progressed to court peals and peals. And then went on to Smith College where the same happened really, um, graduating onto peals um, ladies peels not specifically to ring a ladies peel but because they were at a girls school a girls college and that's how it happened and so there's some of them pictured there now at the beginning I promised you hats and bikinis we've had the hats and now we come on to the bikinis um, this peel was rung in August 1979 um, to celebrate the summer that never was um, some of you will know the ringers there it was run one run rung can't say it rung for the Winchester and Portsmouth um, Guild um, some of you will recognize Anne Bennett who is now Anne Le Marichal um, and others and Christine Joyce who is now Christine Saunders um, it was really her idea to ring this ladies peel um, and Walton Hill was chosen because it was light and they could shut themselves in and lock the door and nobody would be able to see them um, the photo was taken with the camera timer, apparently. Um, the peel was supposed to be followed by a peel wearing corsets, but no stays. Um, they knew that they could easily remove the stays at North Stoneham, but they didn't have six corsets. So it never happened. But um, as we see, there's the bikini peel. Quite what the ladies in 1912 would have thought of this, I do not know. We move on to the 1980s and some of you will recognize um, this as Greenham Common um, where there were a lot of protests going on at the time, women's protests, um, because there was a plan to site nuclear um, missiles here. Greenham Common near Newbury in Berkshire. Now I've included this photo just so that we get Firstly, a feel for the 1980s and the sort of time that it was in terms of feminism and so on, but also, oops, 1980s, there we go, but also just so that I can tell you the story behind this peel, which is a rather wonderful one. Um, I was Lindrem Cox at the time, 
and four of us decided that we were going to go and ring a handbell peel as part of the protest at Greenham Common. Um, I'm the one there with the curly hair at the time and the blue, um, very tasteful jacket thingy. Um, so we drove to this peel in my car. I had a tow bar on the back of this car. Now you might remember in the previous photo, there's a caravan bottom left, just keep that in mind. When we got to Greenham Common, the, the camp in the middle of the woods, the women greeted us with um, joy because of this tow bar on the back of my car, because the bailiffs were about to arrive and tow away the caravan, which contained all their supplies, all their dry supplies. So they asked me if I would drive around the camp until the bailiffs have gone, which I did probably quite illegally, but drove round and round, came back, rang a peel, had something to eat, went to go, discovered we couldn't get the caravan off the tow bar, despite jumping up and down on it, pulling all the levers, everything else we could think of. Um, Gwen had the bright idea that at the end of the road, the sort of the track that led up to the woods, she'd seen a, um, a red phone box. This was of course before mobile phones. So off she trotted and phoned up an RAC man who duly came along, lifted off the caravan with one finger, got back in his car, muttering under his breath, bloody women, and off he went. The other notable thing about this peel is that we did originally ring it for the Cumberlands. And in fact, Gwen was master at the time, but it caused, caused an absolute furor at the AGM a few months later and was thrown out as being far too political. So we had to ring it for the UL instead. So the 1980s, a golden era of ladies peels. One person, um, one ringer who rang in many of these peels said that she felt privileged to be ringing at a time when there was a golden band of ladies and we rang some excellent peels. And I count myself very privileged to be part of this generation, if you like, as well. But just first of all, a little bit about the context. Um, we've looked at Greenham Common. Um, the second wave of feminism talked about equal rights, social rights, and we were, everybody was looking for an opportunity to demonstrate equality. Um, and I remember very well, say, I know I'm not that old, but I was obviously very young. Women ringers were typecast. Um, traditionally, particularly in peels, women would be around the front and the men would be around the back. And we did feel a need to sort of demonstrate equality, to prove ourselves. There were still challenges to be met, although you know, the Peels of London Major and other things had been rung and Peels on 12, there were still challenges and firsts to be rung. And I think a big um, impetus for a lot of the ringing that went on, ladies ringing that went on in the 1980s was Stephanie Pattenden's election as first woman master of the Cumberlands. She was, is, still is, an outstanding back bell ringer, a conductor, and also very encouraging. Um, I remember at practices being encouraged to ring further around the back than I'd been used to doing. Um, so she was very much a role model for a lot of us um, round about that time. And in generations since, a lot of most of the women who ring at Kensington, where Stephanie rings, are 3,200 weight 12, um, have at some point run quarters and things on the tenor and round the back. Stephanie is still the leading ringer of Ladies Peels. She's run 41. And there were lots of other role models of women tenor ringers and conductors around at the time. Um, Alison Regan, for me, in London was one of them. And I know in Birmingham, Fran um, rang a lot of peels round the back and conducted a lot of peels and a lot of the subsequent ladies peels that we're going to look at in a minute. So during the 80s, there were a number of different um, peels, the ladies peels fell, fell into a number of different categories. There were several long lengths, and I understand that a lot of these were inspired by Martin Whiteley. He'd run a lot of long lengths with gentlemen, with men, and suggested to Maggie that she should organise some ladies long length. And I think that's the other thing with um, ladies peels. Certainly in my experience, at the um, male other halves, partners, have been really, really supportive and encouraging and sometimes suggested you ought to organise this, you ought to organise that and been very supportive. So three um, long lengths rung during the 1980s, all of which were records at the time. 
um, so hadn't been rung, um, the record lengths in those methods. So Evesham, Hudsey Surprise Royal, and then Kingston upon Thames, Yorkshire Surprise Maximus, which was then, maybe still is, I don't know, the record peal of um, Yorkshire Surprise Maximus. And there's the picture of the band there. Some of you will recognize some very young looking um, ringers um, who you may, may well ring with today. In the 1980s and the 1990s, there were quite a lot of what I would call big peels. Peels on bells with tenors over 40 hundredweight. So the first of that was Redcliffe, which I think Maggie rang the tenor too. Bow, um, peel of sinks at Bow and York Minster. Certainly Bow and York Minster, I think Fran called. Um, Alison rang the tenor. Maggie rang the tenor at uh, Redcliffe, um, Alison rang the tenor at Bow, and Alison and Julia rang the tenor at York Minster. And then there was a further peal at Bow of Maximus, which Stephanie Pattenden rang the tenor to. So a lot of the same faces in a lot of those peals. Um, and as I say, a lot of role models for those of us that were much more used to ringing round the front, real inspiration. Another heavy um, peal of bells um, that has been rung, in fact, to two ladies' peals, both a peal of caters and royal. And I think there may have been one on the middle six or the front six as well, but certainly a peal of caters and a peal of royal. This particular band is the peal that rang a peal of caters, which was rung in 97 for the Scottish Association. It was sort of joint Newcastle and Durham band and Scottish Association band. Um, Rachel Dyson, who, and I'm particularly posting this peel uh, because there's a rather excellent story. Rachel Dyson on the far right rang the tenor um, and they've got the girls here have got some real memories of that peel. Apparently it was completely freezing because it was in February as Inverary can be in February. Um, and afterwards Rachel was pretty tired, as you would be when you've rung a 4100 weight tenor, was sharing a room with Christine Richardson on the left, um, but actually went to the loo because they were all bursting for the loo afterwards. And as you are often after long peels, ladies peels, and Christine actually had to pu pull Rachel off the toilet because Rachel got stuck, her legs seized up and she couldn't get off the loo. <laughs> so a story associated with that. And Three years later, um, the St Martin's Guild, very appropriately, rang a peal of Cambridge Surprise Royal um, at Inverary with Julia ringing the tenor, which again is a great achievement. Exeter Cathedral, um, still yet the heaviest peal of bells rung by a ladies band, Liverpool to go. Um, again, that story about success is the reward of perseverance. Um, this was rung, Appeal at Exeter, Seven Sinks, was rung in 2008. But in fact, the first attempt had been in April 1994. So this had been an ongoing thing for whatever the maths is, 14 or so years. Um, the first attempt in 2008 went the way that Stedman does with a hesitation on the front, about the first hesitation of the appeal, I think I remember. It was arranged in 1995, um, but that was miscalled. And in fact, we discovered that had it been scored, it would have been false. So after that, several members of the band started families. We all got a bit older. We kept talking about we should really do that again. Um, Howard Eggleston, who was tower captain at the time, kept encouraging um, me or one of us to apply for the bells. Um, and so finally, in September 2007, we booked another attempt. However, there was work on the tower, so that attempt had to be postponed. Um, Julia was actually very relieved because she'd been working out how to tell me that I was going to be a tenor ringer short, and she'd found out that she was going to be expecting a baby. So she, I think, was quite relieved that it was then postponed and finally rearranged for 2008. That's the peel, not Julia's baby, I should say. Um, about half the band in the original attempt, couple who probably hadn't even learned to ring in 1994. We had a full start, nerves, few sixes, but then no hesitations, deviations or repetitions and a very good peel was scored. 
several other, I should just whiz through this very quickly. Most of the big towers, apart from Liverpool, have now had ladies' peels rung at them. And of course, not forgetting that very significant um, peel at St Paul's Cathedral on the day of the Women's Olympic Marathon, which must be must rate amongst the peels listened to by a bigger audience than any other peel. Um, and several of the people in that peel tell me how they could hear the roaring outside. And I can just imagine what the nerves were. I did listen to, I was outside, one of those shouting and listening, and it was a really incredible performance. Very sadly, um, Alison was supposed to be in that peel, um, but she died just less than a month um, before it took place. There's also been some hard peels. I'm gonna whiz through these fairly quickly. First peel of Bristol by a ladies band in 1980. Um, Avon, a silent and non-conducted peel of Bristol just to prove that ladies can remain silent for several hours. Um, Orion, Splice Surprise Maximus with some sort of hardish methods in them. But what um, categorizes all of these peels is that they were a real team effort. And with a lot of ladies peels, you know, they might be hard, they might be Bob Doubles, they might be Bob Minor. They're all, they all are a real team effort because in most cases, people are ringing out of their comfort zone in terms of the bells that they're ringing, the size of the bells that they're ringing. Conductors are often very inexperienced. And just to put these um, hard peels into context, at the time, the methods that you see there, things like Orion, um, Bristol, those compositions are spliced. They've actually been rung by very few bands, so they were real achievements at the time and still would be today. Mentioned spliced earlier, um, in October 1999, we rang a peal of spliced surprise royal, um, composition by Chris Kippin, which is like a one part, so quite hard. Um, again, this was one of those um, perseverance jobs. The first extent, the, sorry, the first attempt had originally been about nine years prior to this. I can't remember how many attempts we had. I think it may have been three or four. Um, but when the peel was finally scored, the, um, the write-up in the ringing world mentioned that, you know, it was a project that had been begun about nine years ago. And we thanked a number of gentlemen, Paul Butler, Paul Bibolo, Steve Bailey, Chris Pickford, Simon Linford, Steve Rossiter, and Roger Bailey. I'm not sure whether they knew how much they'd helped us, but they'd all helped us to make the composition more memorable by being part of one or more mnemonics, some of which are far too rude to repeat. And the real challenge of this peel was that most of us knew each other's mnemonics, so had to look at the floor when we got to the relevant rude bit to make sure that we didn't giggle. But if any of those gentlemen are ringing, uh, sorry, watching this evening, thank you very much. Into the noughties. Obviously, up until now, the Cumberlands have rung an awful lot of ladies' peels. The Ladies' Guild is responsible, has rung the most ladies' guild, ladies' peels, followed closely by the Cumberlands. And obviously, the college youths didn't, haven't rung many or didn't start ringing ladies' peels for obvious reasons until the noughties. And there's been two significant peels. Um, Steph Warboys may be able to tell us more later. I think they were both organised by Steph. Appeal at Appleton of Bristol Royal and Toaster of Yorkshire Maximus. So obviously I wanted to mention those so that I wasn't accused of being biased towards the Cumberlands. Um, going into the noughties, just very quickly, a few more hard peels. A band um, rang Chandler's 23 All the Work, which some of you all know is very difficult. There was a rumour, and we don't know whether this rumour was true, but what spurred us on that we heard a rumour that the college youths had a band of women, and there were, certainly were eight college youths who'd rung this, were going to go for a peel of Chandler's. So several of us got together and decided that we needed to do this first. I don't even know whether the rumour was true, but what spiked the rumour even more was the night before the attempt. Um, it was actually at a Cumberland country meeting, so there were a, up in Newcastle and there were some women, for, some of us from the sort of the South and some of the Newcastle and Durham ladies who'd rung in that peel at Inverary were in this peel. Um, so the night before in the pub, somebody said that Simon Linford had texted to check, um, to say that they'd rung their peel. Um, 
which we think was a wind up, but we don't know um, whether it was whether he did text or not. Anyway, we lost the first attempt um, on the Saturday. And despite having quite a few beers, lots of rhubarb wine in one case, we met the next day on the Sunday afternoon and Julie rang the peel, which was a uh, brilliant. Some of the loudest whooping that I've ever heard, I think, after that. And more recently, some really stunning achievements. Um, and I'm really pleased to include this one, particularly because obviously um, Sue Marshall, I think this was one of the appeals on her pink fizz list. Um, she obviously rang the tenor to that. And very sadly, she is somebody else who is no longer with us. But again, a really remarkable achievement. Followed by an even bigger one. I haven't listed the methods here because there were 147 of them but the most methods run to a ladies band peel in November, 2019. And just finally, another significant peel. Um, in 2007, or we realized it was the um, 30th anniversary of Muriel Rie's thousandth peel. She was the first lady to reach this total. So we got together a band of thousand, lady thousand peelers um, not a thousand ladies peels, obviously, but lady thousand peelers and rang a peel at Worcester All Saints as a congratulation to Muriel for this. Um, there was a real, um, what's the word, a, a plot evolved. Margaret Edwards um, told Muriel that she was going to take her out for the day um, just to listen to a bit of ringing. Muriel had no idea why she was coming to Worcester just to listen to a peel. And so when she realized and was told what the peel was for, she was absolutely delighted. And we presented her with a little card with the peel on it um, and congratulations. And that peel, her first, sorry, her, her thousandth peel was also marked by a poem in the ringing world. And there was a copy of that poem in the, in the little booklet um, leaflet we gave her. And just to summarize, we talked earlier about peels of surprise major. Um, standard eight there, just the year of when they were rung. Yorkshire Surprise Major is the method that's been rung to the most ladies' peels, with 62 of those. You may see that there is an omission there. There has never been a, a peel of Pudsey Surprise Major. Now that may be for a reason, um, but obviously there's a little lock post lockdown project for somebody. So after that very first ladies' peel, we feel sure it will be the first but not the last and of course it wasn't but what would those ladies have thought there have been 503 ladies peels many notable achievements and peels of note obviously not just the ones i've um, pulled out today they've been rung for 60 different guilds associations over 1300 ringers women ringers have taken part the most notable thing i think is that 208 different conductors um, have pulled those peels and for at least 58 it was their first of conductor and when you look through the list of ladies peels there are loads and loads and loads of firsts at all levels um is there a place for ladies peels in the 21st century there's a lot on this slide but i'll just go through it um i asked a lot of i did a sort of survey of women that have ring a lot of ladies peels um over the years and it was a mixed response. Some say, no, it's had its day, but generally it's felt that there is still a place for ladies, women to ring peels together. On occasions to mark anniversaries, things like the ordination of women and name peels. And there's some examples of those um, at the bottom there, anniversaries. Um, there's been a couple of Anne peels and there's also been an Elizabeth peel and a Susan peel. Um, in fact, there's been two Susan peels, but one of them had a guest appearance by David Susan Brown. So it doesn't really count because somebody wasn't able to get there. As Heather said, sometimes it was a girl's night out. Um, ladies' pills have been rung or it's a good reason to fulfill a personal ambition, ring a bigger bell, conduct. And a lot of people commented on how they feel there's fewer egos, supportive. They feel more confident um, ringing something for the first time like a big bell with another band of women. And it's a challenge, it's still a challenge, great sense of achievement and still a team effort. And I'm gonna stop at that point um, and just really dedicate this to Alison, who was my real inspiration, I think, when it comes to um, ringing, peel, well, peel ringing generally. Um, 
not only an inspiration to me, but lots of other women and male ringers as well. So I will stop at that point. And if anybody would like to ask questions. Linda, thank you. Yeah, th thank you so much for that. It was such a, you know, it was lovely to see uh, those photographs and, and hear your stories. You know, it makes, um, bring, you know, really brings to life uh, the, the past. And it's wonderful to see, you know, so many people in, in the audience tonight, um, you know, here present who featured in your, your stories or your photographs. Uh, so again, you I'm know, just looking down to see. <laughs> As you invited earlier on, you know, some of those people might might want to also contribute. I think as you as you kindly and generously say, we have sort of probably about 10 minutes for, for, for questions if, if people would like to. So, you know, either, you know, type into the chat box or raise your hand or actually just unmute yourself. And, um, you know, that, that will that will indicate that, uh, you know, you're you're ready to, to ask a question. But Linda, I, I had one for you. If we were to do this talk or somebody was to do this talk in, say, 50 years time, Let's hope we're out of lockdown by then. But if, if we were to, you know, really were to, what would you hope they would say about women in ringing in the, you know, in the 21st century? Ooh, I would hope that really um, there isn't necessarily, you know, women have, have had, oh gosh, that women have had the confidence and the inspiration and the, the mentors and have achieved as much as they want to achieve without there being any barriers. Um, and I think those barriers are falling, but I still think they do exist in some places, not all. Um, so I would hope that, you know, by then there will be no barriers whatsoever. And all ringers can achieve their full potential, you know, whatever it is. Thank you. Um, there's a, there's lots of sort of chat coming through, um, thanking you for the talk. In fact, loads and loads of uh, uh, thank you. Absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, so, so please have a quick look at the chat box now um, for that. We haven't actually got any other questions coming in. Uh, you sort of you, you've dealt with uh, you dealt with everyone's uh, concerns and questions. I don't know if I'll just um, yeah. Uh, Jonathan, Charlie needs to ring a peel of Pudsey. Best not tell Simon. I was thinking that as you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see you there. I can see you there, Charlie. Definitely. That sounds a good plan, Charlie. I had a second question, but it's a little bit of a mischievous question. Oh and no! Won't be no. Offended. Um, and and you sort of touched on it towards the end, and it's this: Do you think a ladies' guild is still necessary in, in today? And if so, why? <laughs> that's, that's a totally I am, question. Right. I personally have never been a member of the Ladies Guild because I've never felt I needed, I was getting opportunities with the ringers that I rang with. But I know there's a lot of um, women ringers who really value, like I was saying in that last slide, being able to ring with another other women ringers to because they feel comfortable they feel um doing things that they wouldn't necessarily do with men in the band or i mean one of them one of in fact there was a band in another part of the country a ladies guild band which i won't mention um who started ringing peels together as part of the ladies guild to get away from shouty men um who almost stopped them from ringing was the quote i was given um so there are still Whilst there are women who want to ring together as women, I see no problem with it. Ladies is obviously a very old fashioned term now, and I've used that um, throughout because traditionally that's what they've been called, ladies peels or women peels. And in fact, one of the peels, um, <laughs> one of the people I, in fact, I'll, I'll mention names. Um, one of the people I asked about Ladies Peels said, and I asked them how many they'd rung, and she said, I haven't rung any, but I have rung a lot of women's peels. And apparently a former secretary of a former society of which I am a member said that there was no, none of us could ring Ladies Peels because we weren't ladies. So, um, so yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's got a lot of history behind it. And that, that a lot of the people that are members of the Ladies Guild are very, very, um, I think rightly proud of of their history because initially they were very much the the forerunners, you know, the people who were um, 
Edith Parker particularly, and you know Jill Jill Staniforth, other presidents throughout the the ages have been very very instrumental in promoting and giving people opportunities. Super, thank you. Um, I so said the floor has been very, very quiet, except for lots of thanks coming coming through for you. So I'll just take this opportunity to, to, to do a bit of a sell, if you don't mind. Um, uh, and, and before sort of finishing off and seeing if people have do have any other questions or comments. Uh, the, the first thing is, as I said to, uh, you know, said to everyone at the start, you, you're all very warmly welcome to, to the, these events. Um, I'm just going to talk about the next two weeks. Uh, next week, originally, I hadn't actually planned any any talks because I'd hoped Actually, I'd hope to be on holiday uh, myself. Of course, that, that's all changed. So uh, David Hull and myself are organising a social night, a quiz. Um, it's going to be epic when it's planned. Um, so I say you'll be very welcome to that. And the week after that, we have David Pipe join us um, for to, to demystify the secrets behind uh, magic blocks. Uh, but we have a weekly talk uh, running up at the moment to the end of April. And anyone's more than welcome. If you just email smgcbrgmail.com, I've just put the email address in the chat box. Uh, just send me a quick email. I'll add you to our uh, talk, so to speak, mailing list. You won't get all of the bump from the St. Martin's Guild, but you will receive information about the, these talks. Uh, and I say you'll be very welcome. Uh, on February the 27th, we have the Henry Johnson dinner, of course, an online event sadly, because of the current situation. But again, you'll be very, very welcome. Uh, it's free, it's an online event. And I've just put the link also in the chat box. Um, so again, two things, uh, everybody, regardless of whether you're a St. Martin's Guild member or not, you'll be very welcome to, to, to join us for. Uh, Can I just say another, sorry, have you finished please, your bit? Please. No, no, I've finished. No, I just wanted to say while you were doing that, I had a quick flick through who was here. Um, so I just wanted to say hello to everybody that was in one of those a lot of, I can see several people here who featured in photographs um, or peels that I talked about. So it's lovely to see you here. Um, and also several people here, and I'm looking particularly at Chris Kippin and Judith Rogers, um, who've given me a lot of information um, about ladies peels, particularly ones that um, relatives of theirs have, have rung in. So thank you very much to lots of people who've, who've helped me with the research, and um, particularly I can see here, Judith and Chris. Well, where's your research take you? If I've missed anybody out. <laughs> that's lovely. Where, where, that's lovely, thank you. Where's, where's your research take you next, do you think? Or have you finished? Um, well, I've still got, as I say, this, this one article that I was going to write has sort of gradually expanded. And as I say, I suddenly realized, I literally only realized about a week ago that this Friday was the 125th anniversary. So I, there is a, an article in the Ringing World this week about Alice White, which was fairly rapidly put together and researched. Um, but I'm sort of, it's probably another couple to go in terms of looking at the more modern um, ladies' peels and also looking at, you know, what's the point of ladies' peels? And I won't go into what's the point of the ladies' guild because I'm not a member, but, you know, what's the point of, of ladies' peels? Um, but actually, and it's quite funny, as some of you will know, John, who is sitting here quietly, um, <laughs> the author is so far the author, the most, he's the only sort of published in terms of a book author in our household. But I've come across, and in fact, a lot of what I've been doing about ladies' peels um, overlaps with, with what he's now doing, researching the pies, um, the Pie Brothers. Um, and it, But it's not competitive. No, it's not competitive at all. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, and actually, yeah, there's, there's, I just keep coming across all these really, really interesting things. So I might, I did say to John the other day, you know, I could write a book about women in ringing, but I don't know. We'll see. Well, Russell has just asked, are you going to write a book? So I think, uh, I think you, uh, you've sold yourself. Until the lockdown lasts. <laughs> I think you, I think you should, if you've got the time. Um, Super, thank you. Well, without any, I don't think anyone else, last chance for any questions? I think people have been very, very quiet. But I say, Linda, there's lots and lots of thanks in the chat box. So please, please uh, have a look at that. Um, I, you know, as a history teacher, my, my job is to try and bring the past to life for pupils. Uh, and that's, that's actually surprisingly hard to do. Or maybe I'm just not very good at doing it. But, um, you know, what you've done today is really do that for us through your stories and for the photographs. Um, you know, you've really brought uh, sort of, you know, 100 years or 125 years or longer of history really to, to life for us. So, so thank you for that. Thank you for your research into such an important topic um, and such a, you know, something that's so uh, crucial for us. So thank you for coming tonight to speak. Thank you for your work. 
uh, you know, on behalf of myself and St Martin's Guild, we really appreciate it. And thank you very much for coming and for listening. And Charlie, I'll be watching out for that peel. <laughs> Not of plenty though, Charlie. If you, if you want to continue, <laughs> okay. Right. okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Linda said, thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>